a lot of scientific research is propelled by gadgets, instruments, things like microscopes, telescopes, thermometers. These inventions seem pretty simple now, but when they were invented, they opened up whole new worlds of discovery, like universes and drops of water, uh, distant worlds with their own moons. Scientific instrumentation today is a bit more complicated. Uh, things like this, the Large Hadron Collider in Europe, crack open atoms, try to find a new kind of physics to reconcile the problems in our existing theories of physics. But the data that comes out of something like the Large Hadron Collider is not really useful without parallel advances in statistical computing, in data analysis algorithms, and in the hardware that makes it possible to move all this data around. Uh, and together with that, we require some parallel cultural evolution in how to use the data processing and scientific computing responsibly so that it actually gives us answers and not just illusions. Uh, here you see scientists of a previous era pipetting with their mouths, something that would be considered completely unsafe and even grounds for firing in many laboratories. Lots of statistical computing is unfortunately like pipetting with your mouth. For this lecture I want to talk about the scientific computing part of drawing the Bayesian owl, this workflow from the first lecture. Uh, it's important to get the theory right in step one, have some clear communicated theoretical estimate. It, you need to have some way to translate scientific assumptions into structural causal models. And then you need to use logic to get that uh, causal logic into statistical modeling. But in step five here, I think I've let you down so far in the sense that I haven't really said that much about the, the scientific computing part of data analysis for realistically complicated problems. Uh, so far we've done basic linear regression and I've hidden a lot of the computational details from you and to a large extent we can do most of our scientific work with the computational details black boxed away where the experts have uh, safely secured it. Uh, but this lecture is, uh, for this lecture I want to open that box a bit uh, because uh, there's a lot about the way that modern computing works, especially Bayesian computing, um, that requires you to know something about what's going on inside the golem, as it were. So when we say we're just going to analyze the data, uh, if your response is to be a bit sarcastic, uh, that's fair. There's a lot that goes on in this little step five of analyzing the data. There are lots of different machines you can use to compute the posterior distribution or get some approximation rather of the posterior distribution. Um, the first is this analytical approach, the classical approach. I've shown no examples of it in this course because it is completely unimportant aside from understanding the logic uh, of Bayesian analysis, but it's not useful for even um, uh, simple problems. The second is grid approximation, which I showed you in the second lecture. Um, Grid approximation is a great way to understand what Bayesian updating is about as it reinforces that it's just counting, counting all the possibilities for every possible explanation of the data, and then showing the relative numbers of ways that each explanation uh, is compatible with the data. But grid approximation is just too computationally intensive. As models get more complicated, that is the dimensionality of the problem grows. Uh, even the fastest computers in the world are not fast enough to solve your problems uh, within your lifetime. And then the third we've been using up to this point is quadratic approximation or Laplace approximation is sometimes called. And this is where we approximate the posterior distribution as a multivariate normal distribution. Um, this is a really valuable technique. It'll continue to be valuable for a very long time, uh, but it's limited in the sense that Lots of problems uh, are not multivariate Gaussian. And uh, uh, we're going to start to use problems of that kind or encounter problems of that kind in this course now. And so we need some other option. 
So this lecture is about number four, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Markov Chain Monte Carlo um, is very is intensive, but it's not very intensive. It's intensive in the sense that um, models that that uh, would take uh, a second to uh, fit with quadratic approximation might take a minute or half a minute to a minute with Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Maybe that doesn't sound like a bad ratio to you, but when you get into things that take 10 minutes with quadratic approximation, they could take hours or days with Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So why would we ever use it? Um, well, the answer is because it's much more capable. It has many fewer limitations, and in fact it has, it has become essential in many areas of science because it makes it possible to fit models to data that essentially nobody could fit to data before. Before we get into the details of it, though, let's think sort of as an allegory, uh, and I'll walk you uh, in a narrative way into what Markov Chain Monte Carlo is. So imagine an oceanic king, a benign monarch named King Markov, pictured here. And King Markov is the benign ruler of, a, of an archipelago, the Metropolis Archipelago. And this archipelago has a number of islands in it. And the islands are different sizes, and so they have different populations uh, on them, different sizes of populations on them. And as a benign monarch, King Markov has this contract with his people that he will visit them, uh, that his people love him, so he agrees to visit them. He will visit them uh, in proportion to the population sizes of the islands they're on. And uh, his advisors have gotten together and figured out a way that he can do this without any kind of calendar or schedule because King Markov likes to live free. He's a bit of a bohemian. So here's how he does it. <clears throat> so he does a visit on an island, and then at the end of that week of his visit, he flips a coin to choose the island to the left or the right of the current island he's on. Uh, and he calls that island, wherever, whichever the coin chooses, he calls that the proposal island. And there's a half chance uh, of proposing the left or the right. So suppose he, the proposal ends up being the right in this case. Then he will um, ask someone, hey, that island over there, what's its population size? And so he gets uh, uh, an estimate of the population size of the proposal island. Let's call that P sub 5. And he compares that to the population of the current island, which we'll call P sub 4. And then he moves to the proposal island with a probability equal to P5 over P4. Now this number can be greater than 1. In that case, he always moves. But if it's less than 1, then he uses uh, you know, a bag of seashells as, uh, or some dice as a, as a randomization method to obey the probability, or a spinner wheel or some mechanism of that sort. And then he repeats from step one. He spends a week on uh, either he moves or he doesn't. If he stays, he spends another week on island four. The people of island four rejoice, or he moves to island five uh, in this example, and the people of island five rejoice. He spends a week there. Either way, at the end of the next week, he repeats it all over again. It starts over at step one and flips a coin. It turns out, as weird as this procedure sounds, it ensures that in the long run, King Markov will visit each of the islands in proportion to its population size. But only in the long run. In the short run, of course, he could stay on Island 4 for 10 weeks in a row. It's not likely, but it could happen. Let's take that algorithm and animate it so you can get a sense about how it functions. So what I've drawn on this slide on the left is uh, the archipelago represented as a ring. Uh, so that you can loop from the smallest island, which is, is labeled with the number 1. This is, these numbers are relative to the population sizes of the islands, and they're drawn so their areas are proportional to the numbers on them. And the largest one with the red dot on it, that's where King Markov is going to start in the simulation. That's the 10th island. And on the right, we have a histogram that is going to count up the numbers of visits he has made to each of these islands, starting from now. And you'll see that he makes proposals, and he leaps across on his little royal boat, or he stays, and then we count up uh, weeks of visits on the right, and you'll see that the, the bars grow. And at first it's just a jagged 
a mess. There's no real pattern because it's incredibly random. There's no long range plan here, remember. King Markov is not planning for the future. He's just deciding every week whether he stays or moves, and he does so with a random device. But quickly you, you start to see that he spends more time on big islands, right? Because uh, jumps to bigger islands are more likely than jumps to smaller islands. But jumps to smaller islands are possible. So in the very long run, after several hundred visits, uh, you'll see that there's the pattern is well established and he tends to visit each of the islands in direct proportion to its relative population size, relative to the other islands uh, in the archipelago. This algorithm, of course, this it doesn't really have anything to do with oceanic monarchs. Uh, this is an example of Markov chain Monte Carlo. Our usual, usual use of it in scientific computing is to draw samples from a posterior distribution, or really any distribution, but we're going to use it in this class for posterior distributions. The islands in the example are the parameter values, the explanations of the data that we've been interested in up to this point in the course. And the population sizes are the posterior probabilities of each of those parameter values, each of those explanations. The relative numbers of ways that that parameter value or island could explain the data. And uh, what, these, what the algorithm uh, that I just showed you does is it uh, guarantees that in the long run, uh, that the computer will visit each parameter value in proportion to its posterior probability. And all you need to be able to do computationally is compute the posterior probability for any specific combination of the parameter values one at a time. So you don't have to evaluate, like in grid approximation, the entire grid. You just do uh, the proposal and your current location. So it's just two posterior probabilities, two little spots in the grid. And that's what you need to know if you move. And at every step, Every proposal step, again, there's just two numbers to compute. This algorithm scales up to more dimensions. In the islands example, there's just one dimension. That is, there's just the location, the island that, the, that King Markov is on. But of course, we often have many parameters in our models. Um, and uh, this algorithm uh, can handle that as well. It's called a Markov chain because uh, it's a temporal sequence. That is, the values are sampled in sequence, and the next sample or the next proposal only depends upon the most recent one. So as I'm showing here on this slide, you can represent it as a migration through time from the left to the right with increasing samples. This is the King Markov on the far right there wandering around, and the path behind him is the, the Markov chain, so to speak the chain of visits that he's been at. You can see he tends to spend more time near the top of this plot because those are the populous islands, but he does wander to the, to the islands with smaller populations, and he does so in the long run in proportion to their population size. So this is a key feature of the Markov chain is that what, what makes something a Markov chain is that history doesn't matter. Uh, where you're going to go next only depends upon where you are now. And that's why King Markov doesn't need records or any planning or any calendar. And that's what he likes about it. The Monte Carlo part of Markov chain Monte Carlo just means some numerical algorithm that uses randomization to perform a calculation. And there are lots of Monte Carlo techniques in the sciences. Markov chain Monte Carlo is only one of them. So um, here we've, I've zoomed out on that same chain. You can get a sense now of how the it the visits aggregate in the more populous islands. You can see it a little better. Uh, this particular algorithm that's animating at the top here is known as the Metropolis algorithm. And it's a very simple version of Markov chain Monte Carlo, and or MCMC as it's usually abbreviated. Uh, in fact, it's, it's the original one, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. It's very easy to write it. Uh, so in the book, I have a, a, a small example. You can do it in um, half a dozen lines of R code or any other scripting language. And it's very general. You can apply lots of problems to it. Uh, however, it's often inefficient, especially as the dimensionality of the problem grows. It can be quite hard to tune it and make it work. This Metropolis algorithm uh, comes from this paper shown here. It's a very famous paper in, in the computational sciences. 
uh, the Metropolis, Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, Teller and Teller, 1953, uh, with the very exciting title, Equation of States Calculations by Fast Computing Machines. This is one of those papers that started a whole new field, actually, uh, not just a field, but a bunch of um, uh, solutions that span individual scientific fields. It's been cited for over 47,000 times by latest count. Uh, this is an incredible piece of work, and the bulk of the computational work, I think nearly all of it, was done by one person, one of the authors, Ariana Rosenbluth, uh, who's pictured in the upper right of this slide. Uh, she's also the person uh, lunging there in the foreground on the left, the fencer. Um, Ariana Rosenbluth was uh, an Olympic fencer, qualified for the Olympics, but uh, World War II prevented her from competing. Uh, and then she uh, went on to get a PhD in physics uh, from Harvard and then to work on the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, where she programmed uh, machines to do all manner of simulations, including the first uh, Metropolis algorithm simulation, the first um, scientific application of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And uh, a lot goes into this. Now, um, uh, lots of, of um, scientific computing students learn how to write these algorithms, but to invent one is a whole different business, and to make it work with the computer hardware at the time is indeed quite an achievement. So this is the computer that Ariana Rosenbluth had to work with. Uh, this thing was called Maniac. Uh, I'll tell you what, why it's called that in a moment. Maniac um, is a huge number of transistors and vacuum tubes and other things. Uh, and by modern standards, a very feeble computer, but at the time it was one of the most capable ones. And at Los Alamos, they were putting it to use for lots of different purposes. Um, Nick Metropolis, uh, who gave his name to the Metropolis algorithm, uh, is pictured here in the foreground on the left, smoking the cigarette. And uh, I'm not sure if he called the computer maniac or someone else did, but it's a bit of an inside joke, obviously. It stands for Mathematical Analyzer, Numerical Integrator, and Computer. And the idea was that scientific acronyms had already become absurd at the time, and so they were playing with the game as a bit of a pun. Um, Maniac weighed 1,000 pounds, uh, had only 5 kilobytes of memory, and could do 70,000 multiplications per second. Now, 5 kilobytes of memory and, uh, and 70,000 multiplications per second may sound like a lot if you're a person, because um, uh, you may not have direct short-term access to 5 kilobytes of memories, and 70,000 multiplications per second is not something you could consciously do. Uh, unconsciously, perhaps, but not consciously. Uh, but in contrast, your laptop, even a, a cheap laptop that's five to seven years old, will only weigh four to seven pounds, have uh, more than eight million kilobytes of memory, and be capable of billions of multiplications per second. Uh, Maniac was capable at the time, but it was very difficult hardware to program in. The memory was cramped, the operations were limited, and uh, most of the programming tools we take for granted now, high-level languages, compilers, debuggers, simply didn't exist. So Ariana Rosenbluth had a really incredible task here. Um, before I talk about the details uh, of, the, uh, of these algorithms, or, or rather show you heuristically how they function, uh, I want to give you an idea about how big this topic is now. Um, Markov Chain Monte Carlo is a huge field, and there are people that spend their whole careers just working on these algorithms, inventing new ones, um, inventing diagnostics for them, uh, finding new ways to make them efficient. And uh, so the, the sort of plain Metropolis algorithm that Rosenbluth uh, invented, uh, or rather uh, found a computerized algorithm for, um, mathematicians came up with the basic strategy. Uh, isn't of much use anymore because we have much more efficient algorithms to use. Uh, but that's not to disrespect it at all because uh, without the Metropolis algorithm, or maybe we should call it the Rosenbluth uh, algorithm, we wouldn't have the new ones uh, either. Um, there have been a lot of innovations, especially in the last two decades, and all of the new best methods for Markov Chain Monte Carlo use gradients. Uh, gradients, I'll say more about this later, but the, the gradient has to do with the curvature of the distribution you're sampling from, the local curvature at each point. And I'll, I'll say why that helps uh, as we go forward. The gradient method we're going to talk about and use in this course is called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And the, the Hamiltonian is a term from physics that has to do with the energy in a system. 
and it has to do, uh, I'll say why in a bit, but let's still talk about uh, the Rosenbluth algorithm, uh, usually known as the Metropolis algorithm. The way it works, as you saw with King Markov, was to make proposals and then consider that proposal in relation to your current position. So in continuous space, uh, how does that work? And I'm showing you on this slide is a typical normal distribution um, estimation problem where we've got uh, the mean of a normal distribution on the horizontal axis and the standard deviation sigma on the vertical. Uh, but we're showing the logarithm of the standard deviation so that it's continuous, so there's no boundary at zero. So the negative numbers are, are below one. If you exponentiated them, uh, right, they'd be above zero. So what you're seeing with the blue, oh, I should say the, the rings on this slide represent the shape of the posterior distribution that we want to draw samples from. If we, if we knew it, uh, it would have this shape. It would look like a hill, or rather, I want you to think of this thing as a bowl, where the, in the center of this slide is the region of highest posterior probability, and that's down in a valley. Things tend to sink into it. And then as you move towards the edge and the, and the contour lines get closer together, those are ridges that are rising up, and those are regions of, of very low posterior probability. And we don't want to visit those places very often. Um, because they're like islands with small population sizes. Then the blue line you see there is the first proposal. Uh, and uh, this chain is going to animate. And what you'll see is that if there's a red dot, that's a rejected move through the randomization device. And when it otherwise, it will move and there'll be a new black dot. And, those, and then those points are the samples that we collect. And if we pile up all those samples, we get the posterior distribution. If we get enough of them, we get an approximation of the posterior distribution. So I think you can see this, this thing about these algorithms is that they only act locally. They don't know the posterior distribution. That's why we need these methods, because we don't know the posterior distribution. We can't sample from it directly. But we can blindly stumble around it miraculously and draw proper samples from it. And that's what these Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms allow us to do. And they're often uh, a most efficient solu solution for directly sampling from arbitrary probability densities. One of the things about the, the Rosenbluth algorithm uh, that is frustrating is that it has to be tuned. Um, so the, the size of the proposal, that is how far from your current location you consider moving, uh, has a big effect on how efficient the algorithm is. And, and basically you, you lose at one extreme or the other. So you have to tune these things in general applications. So on the left, I'm showing you uh, the animation from the previous slide, what I'm calling the large step size version of the simulation. You'll see that the blue bars are often quite large. This simulation is willing to consider points very far from the current location. As a consequence, lots of them are red, meaning that they're rejected. And then the change just stays still for many steps in a time as it is right there. Uh, and that wastes a lot of computation. What you'd really like is for every proposal to be accepted, to always propose points that are valid in the posterior distribution and to always move there. But that's not possible with this algorithm. On the right, you've got the other extreme, uh, small step sizes, only considering very local proposals. Uh, this is like King Markov's algorithm where he only considered neighboring islands. And when you do it this way, you only very rarely reject, or much more rarely reject moving. It still happens. Um, so you take more samples, but the samples are really close to one another. And as a consequence, each additional sample doesn't add a lot of information about the shape of the distribution. In contrast, on the left, when you do manage to move, you learn a lot more because the points are less uh, similar to one another after a move. So all computational methods have um, trade-offs like that. So there's nothing special about that. But it turns out uh, we can do a lot better. And that's what these modern gradient methods do. So let's consider an analogy before I show you what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo looks like. I want you to think about skateboarding and skate parks. So here, like this bowl. That's what I would call this a big bowl. And uh, the very talented uh, young man there uh, who is skating, uh, there's a sense in which, of course, his skateboard doesn't know anything about the shape of that bowl, and yet it rolls effort effortlessly around it. Um, and because uh, the potential energy as he rolls around this thing is highest on the edges, 
he will, it will naturally turn him around under the force of gravity, and he will tend to spend more time uh, near the bottom. And so this is like the high probability region of a posterior distribution, whereas the edge is the low probability region because he can't stay there uh, as, a, as a moving skateboardist, as it were. So what if we could use a strategy like this to sample from arbitrary distributions, represent them like bowls, uh, uh, they don't have to be perfectly Gaussian bowls, they can have odd shapes like the one you see on your slide, um, uh, and then we put virtual skateboarders uh, to thrash around in there. We flick them through the bowl and let them do a couple tricks, and as we track their positions, their positions over time will tend to take samples from the shape of this bowl because they spend more time near the bottom than near the top. Uh, and it turns out you can do this, and this is what the algorithms I'm going to show you next uh, actually do. And it seems weird that we can do this, but we really are. We're going to run uh, skateboard simulations or, or frictionless skateboarder simulations uh, inside the computer so we can take samples. Okay, how does this actually end up looking? Now I've got uh, my virtual skateboardist lined up on the edge of the bowl there. There's that little blue tick. He's about to start rolling. Um, and it's the same Gaussian posterior uh, problem as I had um, um, before with the mean of a normal distribution to be estimated on the horizontal and its log standard deviation on the vertical. Now what's going to happen here, remember, is the middle of this contour is the center of the bowl. It's the bottom. And then the, out on the edges, we've got the, the, the ridges, the edge of this thing. And so we're just going to start a physics simulation, literally, and um, it's going to be a frictionless skateboard, and it's going to roll the following. We're going to flick it with momentum in a particular direction, a random direction, in fact. And then we're going to let physics do the rest. And we're going to let it run for a little while, as you see here, and it follows the contour and rolls back down. And then we stop it after some particular length of path, and we record the position, and that's what those black dots are. And then we flick the skateboarder again in a random direction. We let the physics simulation go, turns around, record the position. And um, every one of these uh, uh, trajectories, they're called, results in a sample from the posterior distribution. Now you have to be careful exactly how you do these calculations so that it's a proper Markov chain, uh, but it's not that complicated uh, to do it. And the mathematicians have figured out the details for us to make it work. Uh, this is a, a fantastically very useful sort of thing, but it requires the gradients, as I said. The additional thing you need to know here is the local curvature. That is, you need to know what the skateboard knows. You need to know whether you're going uphill or downhill in any particular local position so that you can run the simulation. Because this is not a metaphor that I'm running a physics simulation here. This really is a physics simulation a little frictionless particle rolling around on the posterior distribution. And the samples just come from its position at fixed points in time. So um, these methods also require some tuning. And uh, you can have really long trajectories, uh, like on the left, and take let the skateboard roll for a long time. And since it's frictionless, it'll roll forever, actually. They'll never stop. Uh, uh, this is not always the most efficient thing to do because often it'll loop back and you get this phenomenon I talk about more in the book called the U-turn phenomenon where the trajectory turns around and so you end up with samples that are really similar to one another because they end up next to one another as you see on the left and that's not optimal. Now in the long run it will be fine and you will take valid samples from the posterior distribution and explore it. It's just less efficient. On the right, we've got the other extreme. We have um, really short uh, steps. You see the little increments in the blue worm there. Those, that's called step size. And when the trajectories are short and have small steps, um, exploration is slower. Uh, uh, but in a few jumps, you can still traverse the whole shape of the thing um, and get valid samples. It just may take longer to explore the whole shape of the distribution. Um, Modern engines, as I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, figure out these parameters for you. They, they have an, an adaptation algorithm in them to try and figure out the right step size and length of trajectory. That is, how, how fast and how long the skateboarder should go so that you can um, efficiently explore the posterior distribution. 
Now, of course, the distribution on this slide is not hard to sample from, and, and the basic uh, Rosenbluth or, or Metropolis algorithm will have no problem sampling from it either. We don't really need Hamiltonian Monte Carlo for this distribution. It's a bit of overkill, uh, although it's fun to watch. Uh, where Hamiltonian Monte Carlo really shines and becomes essential is in more complicated posterior distributions. And the thing about with many dimensions, and the, the thing about more complicated posterior distributions, which arise even in modestly more complicated models than the ones we've used so far in the course, is that they often have very high correlations in them uh, between the parameters. So let me show you a, a really simple example of that. This is still only a two-dimensional example because uh, who can see 3D or 4D on a slide, right? So we'll, we'll uh, stare at this, and even though it's only two dimensionals, uh, you know, imagine it's very high dimensional, and, and these correlations exist between a bunch of parameters simultaneously. Um, what your Markov chain sampler has to do is move along some hyperdimensional thin ridge, like the oval on this on on your screen here. This shows the again the posterior the contours of the posterior distribution. And the oval in the center is the high probability region. That's where we want to spend our time. That's where the skateboarder will spend uh, his time. And the uh, uh, more closely packed ridges are the, the low probability regions where gravity forces you back towards the middle. And we can, uh, Metropolis has a really hard time with distributions like this because it tends to, since this is such a narrow, um, uh, shape in the middle, Metropolis will tend to make proposals in the bad part, in uh, outside the ridges, and almost all of them will be rejected. And so it's hard for Metropolis to move around a space like this because it doesn't know anything about the global shape. The thing about the skateboard that is really cool is that even though the skateboard doesn't know anything about the global shape either, the fact that it senses the curvature where it is, it knows which direction to roll, means it effectively explores the global shape quite efficiently. That is, it won't roll uphill. And that means it makes good proposals. So let me show you what that looks like in animation. Here's our skateboarder. We stopped, started him on the edge. Now he rolls around in the middle and takes some samples. And you'll see that um, even though at any point in time the simulation only knows the local curvature, it's not calculating the whole posterior distribution, it doesn't know it, it has to get that from the samples, it still manages to find the shape of the, of the oval in the middle uh, of the slide and take, and take samples from it um, and make these zigzaggy snake patterns. And uh, um, all the algorithms, there are other algorithms that also use gradients, um, and they can be as efficient as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and that's because what they all share is this ability to sort of uh, find the global curvature by considering local curvature, is eventually find global curvature by considering local curvature. They're not magic. And so yes, with enough samples, as you see here, um, you can get the whole shape pretty rapidly. Okay, that's Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. If you're interested in the actual details of the algorithm, you want to see what it looks like in code, um, on pages 276 to 278 of my book, uh, I show you how to do this with basic R scripting. You can, you can uh, write the simulations I just showed you with basic R scripting. It's not that complicated, and I take you through um, all the justifications for the different parts. And the, the, the key thing about this, the, uh, the physics simulation part is actually pretty easy. It's just a loop. Uh, that, that calculates velocities and updates the position of a particle. It's, a, it's, it's not, um, maybe it, 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 off the top of your head, you wouldn't know how to write that. Uh, but once you've seen it, you'll agree it's just a little loop with some updates of positions. Um, the tricky part is that for every model you write and want to analyze this way, you have to calculate the gradient somehow. You need the derivative uh, in, for every parameter of the log posterior probability. And uh, for big models, that means a lot of derivatives, and it means a lot of uh, calculations and a lot of custom programming for every problem. We are not going to have to do that. But uh, if you're interested in that, I explain more uh, on these three pages in the book. Okay, so uh, uh, gradients, yes. Uh, keep talking about gradients, and we need them. Um, here's another video to give an impression to you about how the gradient governs the motion, right? So here's the skateboard's view, as it were, of moving along a half pipe, a particularly deadly half pipe with this bizarre trap in it. And uh, the, the skateboard doesn't know anything about the global shape, but it can find it. All it needs at any particular point is its curvature. 
And so that's what we need to calculate for any arbitrary half pipe structure. So how do we do that? How do we maintain our convenience of writing general statistical models and calculate the curvature of Tony Hawk's half pipe? So uh, we need gradients. And as I said, uh, you can write them yourself. Uh, you could go and measure any particular half pipe and get the curvature at every point, And you could represent that knowledge um, uh, with in giant tables that you could look up as you do the simulation, but that's not very efficient. Or you could have equations if you can, if you can describe the shape of the posterior distribution with general equations. Uh, the general problem is that um, that means we have to recode the Markov chain for every model. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to write them yourself. Instead, uh, there's this fantastic scientific computing technique called AutoDiff which stands for automatic differentiation. And what AutoDiff does is it takes your computer code and it computes symbolic derivatives, that is the gradients, uh, from your model code. That is to say, you, when you write a statistical model, just like the ones we've been writing in this course up to this point, what you're writing is an expression, an analytical expression, for the posterior probability. And that defines the distribution we want to sample from. That is, you can plug in fixed values for all the parameters, and you can get the number, uh, relative numbers of ways that the data could arise from that combination of parameter values. That's the posterior probability. Of course, we want to evaluate it, um, evaluate the, the posterior distribution for all combinations of parameter values, and that's a tall order. If you had the derivatives of that expression for the posterior probability, you'd know which way was uphill and downhill from any particular combination of parameter values you had. And in mathematics, when we take a set of derivatives like that from a function, you get a matrix that's called a Jacobian, as shown on the right-hand side here. And it's just a matrix of derivatives for the, some particular function here, capital B, uh, uh, for some number of input um, variables. In our example, these would be parameters. Um, you take the derivative with respect to that parameter. And uh, this gives you um, uh, information about whether it's uphill or downhill for any particular parameter. If you increase that parameter, would the probability go up? If you decreased it, uh, would it go down? Um, and AutoDiff does this for you. That's why it's called automatic differentiation. It can do this because taking derivatives is, uh, relatively speaking, easy. Uh, there are rules for it, and your computer is very good at following them. Uh, still, the, the computer science that goes into these algorithms is really amazing, and uh, we're lucky that, that people have written them for us, and we can just use the libraries that make it work. Um, automatic differentiation is not unique to Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or even Markov chain Monte Carlo. It's used in a lot of machine learning approaches. Um, for any kind of high dimensional uh, machine learning that goes on these days, which is most of it, let's be honest, uh, you need gradients um, to search the space because there's too many parameters and the parameter space is just too big to do any kind of brute force thing. And so, uh, for example, some of you will have heard of backpropagation, which is used a lot in neural networks. Backpropagation is a special case of automatic differentiation. Okay, as I said, you're not going to have to do any of that yourself. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, instead, we're going to use uh, the Stan Math Library to do the automatic differentiation for us. You'll be able to continue writing the model definitions uh, as you have been so far, and Stan will compute the gradients for you. Uh, this makes things really nice. Stan is a, a very professional um, uh, open source computing, scientific computing project that uh, is used both in the sciences uh, and in industry quite a lot now. And uh, Stan is not an acronym. It doesn't stand for anything. Stan is a man, or was a man. Uh, it's named after um, Stanif Stanisław, I think that's pronounced. Uh, it's a Polish name, Stanisław Ulam, uh, who lived between 1909 and 1984. And uh, Stan uh, was the is credited as the father of Monte Carlo methods. He's a brilliant mathematician, um, uh, fled Europe during the, the Second World War, uh, like many brilliant European mathematicians, and went on to make uh, very important contributions in many areas of mathematics, um, physics, uh, and biology. Uh, really an extraordinary career. And the Stan um, Math Library is named after him uh, because of, of Stanisław's uh, um, contributions that, that uh, paved the way for later innovations in the Monte Carlo methods. 
oh yeah, here's here's uh, Stanislav with his uh, daughter Claire when she was quite young at Maniac because they all worked at Los Alamos. Um, and uh, Stanislav uh, did analytical mathematics uh, to design the calculations and then Ariana Rosenbluth and others programmed the computers to actually execute them. Okay, that's a lot and it's mostly conceptual work so far, but nevertheless, I think we should pause. And as always, it'd be a good idea to take a look back through the slides so far, see if there's anything um, that remains confusing, take a couple notes, uh, then go for a walk, have a cup of tea or coffee. And when you come back, I'll be here. Welcome back. Let's pick up by actually doing some work now. So what I've tried to do so far in this lecture is give you a conceptual, a heuristic, uh, and a little bit of a historical introduction to both Markov chain Monte Carlo and especially Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Now I wanna show you more of the workflow uh, that we do with this uh, in a typical applied Bayesian data analysis scenario. So let's go, let's revisit an example we already know so I don't have to introduce a new data set. Let's think of the divorce data again uh, from last week. Um, all I'm doing on this slide is trying to remind you of the model we used, one of the models we used when we analyzed that data set. This is a linear regression. I'll show you the mathematical model notation on the right of the slide, the code on the left. It's a linear regression with two predictors. That is, we're stratifying divorce rates simultaneously by marriage rate and age at marriage. That's the D for divorce rate, M for marriage rate, and A for age at marriage. Uh, no surprises, I hope, by this point. And the code on this slide is the uh, standard quadratic approximation code you would have used before. All that's different about it is I've, I've defined the formula list as a separate object and then passed it into the quap call at the bottom of the, of the code block there. To um, fit this same model with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, if you're using my rethinking package, uh, all you need to do is pass the same formula list to the ULAM function there shown at the bottom. And what ULAM will do is it will actually it will build stand code and it will pass the whole job over to the stand math library, let it compute the gradients, run the physics simulation, collect the samples, and then uh, ULAM will return those samples to you and you can analyze them just like the samples from QAP. Uh, that is all the same uh, convenience functions that you've been using so far uh, to analyze QAP models um, like LINK and extract samples will also work for models you fit with ULAM. Um, the, all, the, all the machinery is different under the hood, uh, but all, everything you've learned so far about how to analyze posterior distributions is still true, and you've already learned how to work with samples. In this case, this is all we get. All we get are samples. There is no analytical representation of the posterior distribution when you do Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, but now you're already a pro at that, and you're ready to go. So you run this, I encourage you to run this and make sure you get everything installed right and uh, 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 see if you can uh, reproduce the results that I'm showing you here. This is the Precy output uh, for the divorce model fit with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and, and the means and standard deviations and compatibility intervals are practically identical. This is a standard linear regression. We don't need Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo for a problem like this, but this is where we start so that you understand that it's giving the same results in principle. And as we scale up to bigger kinds of models, quadratic approximation simply won't work at all. And we're gonna to have to do it with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, what's different in the Precy output, uh, I'm sure you've already noticed, are these two new columns on the right the nf column uh, you can you can say that nef if you like uh, i tend to say nf and uh, r hat four uh, i'm going to explain what those are in a bit let's just hang on a second but what they're about is is diagnosing um, how well the simulation has functioned uh, how well the the skater performed uh, as it were um, before I do that though, before we talk, talk about the workflow and diagnosing the machine's performance, um, I wanna talk about 
uh, what this model would look like in pure stand code. So ulam is a convenience function so that you can keep working with those standard kind of mass stats model formulas. Um, but what's really going under the hood in, in uh, scientific computing requires more input than that uh, because the mathematics is ambiguous uh, in those formulas. There's a lot of uh, intuitive knowledge that you bring to the context, but the computer needs to be told that because it doesn't know it. Now, if you're not interested uh, so what I'm going to do in the next couple slides is show you what the STAN code is like and give you some uh, first meeting with STAN just so you get it so it's less mysterious. Uh, if you're not interested in working with STAN right now, feel free to skip this section and keep going. Uh, you can check the chapter bookmarks on the, on the uh, YouTube progress bar, on the time progress bar at the bottom of the video. Okay, so uh, STAN code is worth learning on its own eventually. I think about my rethinking package as just a scaffold to get you into using Stan or some other um, uh, similar programming language like Turing uh, in the Julia environment. And the reason is because uh, these uh, probabilistic programming languages like Stan or Turing are incredibly expressive and you can do a lot more with them if you get comfortable with programming in them directly. They're also very portable in a way that R code is not. Um, of course, R is portable on lots of devices. You can probably run it on your watch now. Um, but the same Stan model can be compiled in any scripting language because Stan doesn't depend upon any particular scripting languages. And that means that you can share it with lots of colleagues in high performance computing. On the right, I'm showing you the uh, Stan code for the divorce model and you can always get ulam to spit out the equivalent stand code by typing the command at the top here that i've commented out the stand code function and then the name of the fit model object and then it will display um, the stand code that was actually run let me explain each of the parts of this for you uh, and i'm not going to go into um, intricate detail here i just want to give you an idea of, of the general personality of each of these blocks so the top part of every stand model is a data block and this is where we declare observed variables uh, it's things usually that we call data but they're observed variables in bayesian data analysis so these are the divorce rates uh, the ages at marriage and the marriage rates um, and uh, you'll notice that the names are the same here d a and m um, but they're all prepended by this this word vector and then in brackets 50 now 50 is the length there are 50 observations because there are 50 states in the united states um, and vector is the kind of data. It tells Stan how the variable is represented in memory. And this is, uh, if you haven't programmed in languages like C that require this, this seems really strange because R and Python don't normally require you to say anything about the, the representation of the variable in memory. Maybe once in a while you've coerced something to be an integer and so you've gotten a, a slight whiff of this and what it's about. Um, this is essential, though, in, um, in high-performance computing. Uh, for, for code that's going to be compiled down in machine code, you have to tell the computer unambiguously what the memory representation is going to be. And the reason is because uh, this allows Stan to catch errors in your coding. Uh, that is, you try to do something that's not allowed with a particular type. Um, and uh, that's really indispensable because it reduces the amount of debugging uh, you need to do um, Basically, it creates internal consistency checks at the code. Uh, it's a way of proofing the code as you write it, as it were. And the second block are the parameters. These are the unobserved variables in the model, right? Remember, in a, in a fundamental sense, in Bayes, uh, parameters are just unobserved um, uh, variables, unobserved data. We'll push that uh, metaphor to its limits in a, uh, in a later week. Um, and the same thing holds here. <clears throat> uh, Stan needs to know the types of each of these so it knows which checks to run and which constraints uh, exist. So notice, for example, <clears throat> that sigma here has a constraint lower equals zero. It must be a positive real value. Finally, there's the model block. Uh, this is the block that's most similar to the code you've been writing so far. It restates the distributional assumptions of the model. Uh, the squiggles we've been putting into our model formulas up to this point. But you can put a lot more kinds of code inside of a stand model block than you can in a Quap or Ulam model. Although you can, you can do a lot in those as well. 
Um, in very large models, complicated models, like latent variable models, the model block can become very complicated. Uh, you can analyze multiple data sets at the same time, have, have complicated simultaneous equation systems, ordinary differential equations, large numbers of things. Uh, we're going to keep doing regression for a little while with this and we'll gradually build up the complexity. There'll be no sudden transition. Okay, uh, to run the stand model, what do you do? Well, you take that stand code and you save it as its own text file. Uh, and uh, this is a, a hygienic way to do scientific computing. You make each, each uh, stand model its own uh, independent text file so you can manage uh, the complexity of your project. And then if you're using rethinking, uh, you can just pass this, the name of this file to the C stand command, C stand for command stand, and it will sample just like Ulam does because this is what Ulam does. It builds, except Ulam builds the stand code for you and then it passes it um, to command stand and then returns the results to you. So you're just skipping the middleman here and hopefully understanding the underlying complexity a little better. And then you can work with samples um, from from uh, pure stand models just like you did the others because it's the same output. No matter what um, interface you use, if you're using Markov Chain Monte Carlo, if you know the model, once you get the samples, you can compute anything you need. Okay, <clears throat> let's continue with uh, thinking about the workflow here. And in particular, I wanna emphasize sort of um, hygiene responsibilities that we have when working at scientific computing algorithms like Markov Chain Monte Carlo. These algorithms are seemingly magical when they work, um, but they're not magical. They work because uh, people have spent a lot of time making them work and thinking about ways to diagnose when they don't work. So I wanna spend a little bit of time uh, introducing you to the diagnostics that we use in Markov Chain Monte Carlo. This is really an essential part of the workflow. It's an, in, in the same sense that the other things are, like like stating your estimate and justifying the statistical strategy. Those are general responsibilities. When you use Markov Chain Monte Carlo, you also have a responsibility to check that the algorithm functioned correctly uh, and also to provide the information so your colleagues can trust that uh, it, it functioned correctly, right? Just like all the other parts of your analysis. And I'm gonna go through five different things just to introduce them to you. And as you uh, do this work yourself, you'll quickly become comfortable uh, with each of these forms of diagnostics and understand the relationships among them. So the first one is called trace plots. And in a sense, this is the graphical display that people most associate with Markov Chain Monte Carlo. In the trace plot, all we do is take the sequential samples from the Markov chain for each parameter, and we plot them as a timeline. So here for the divorce model, I've taken the intercept parameter alpha, and I've just plotted the sequential samples. We took a thousand samples from the Markov chain, starting on the left and going all the way to the right. And uh, the gray region is a region that's called the warm-up by Stan. And the warm up is when Stan is figuring out step size and how long the trajectory should be. I say more about this in the book and you can read a lot more about it in the Stan manual if you like. Uh, we don't usually use the warm up for inference. It's, it's not necessarily a valid part of the posterior distribution, but it's, it's nice to show it in the trace plot so you can see how the warm up phase proceeded. Uh, outside of the warm-up phase on the right half of this graph, those are the, the 500 samples we have for inference, uh, which in this case is plenty. Um, you'll see that there's an NF equals 321 displayed in the upper right. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's, let's, let's turn our gaze away from that for now. Uh, we don't just look at one parameter, though. We look at all the parameters. Uh, we want to ensure that um, for every parameter that the trace plot looks healthy. And what does that mean? Well, that means that it's stationary. It tends to stay in the same uh, part of the distribution as these four do. You'll see that they're zigzagging around uh, within the same area. They don't drift up and down uh, to a large extent as the simulation goes on. They're exploring the, the lower part of, of the half pipe, uh, as it were. Um, Sometimes people say that the, it's the hairy caterpillar test. You want the trace plots to look like hairy caterpillars, um, if, if that's something that you're familiar with. So 
one chain is not enough. What I've just showed you is the, the trace plot for only one Markov chain. And typically we will run more than one Markov chain simultaneously. And we do that because a strong test that the chain is healthy is that multiple chains converge to the same distribution. Uh, this is a criterion we call convergence. Uh, uh, you want each chain to explore the correct distribution and stay there when it finds it to be stationary. And you want every chain to explore the same distribution, that is to be stationary in the same place. And that means starting multiple chains from independent, different starting locations, often quite dispersed starting locations, and ensure that they converge to the same distribution. This is easy to do. Uh, in, in Ulam, you just add uh, the chains argument. Uh, four is a good number. Um, most uh, computers have lots of cores these days, and you can run a different chain on every core in your computer. Uh, and if you want it to run them all simultaneously, be sure to add the cores command as well. So here I'm running four chains on four cores, and they'll all run simultaneously. And this model runs very fast. Try it for yourself uh, and see. Um, and now I'm going to layer them in. This is this is what we showed before. It's it's the first chain from this model, and then the second one. Uh, it's, converges very quickly to the same place and stays in the same place, and then the third one, and then the fourth one. And this is what you want to see. Now, this is not a guarantee that the chain uh, function, that the Markov chain function correctly, uh, but if the Markov chain functions correctly, uh, this is what you should see. Um, trace plots are pretty limited, though. Uh, one of the things about them is that they the, the chains overlap. The fuzzy caterpillar is too complicated. And so there could be a chain in there that's misbehaving, and you can't see it because it's occluded by the other parts of the caterpillar, if that makes any sense. Uh, so uh, a more recent graphical innovation that I like a lot more are these tr uh, normalized trace rank plots. I call them trank plots. No one else does, but I'm going to keep trying to make fetch happen. And uh, trank plots, um, well, first of all, they're just gorgeous. I hope you agree to the one on this slide. What are they, though? So again, they're, they're trace plots. So the horizontal axis is sequential samples. Uh, on the far left is the start of the simulation. And then on the right, um, the end. And this is just the post warm up sample. So I'm not showing the gray region for the trank plot. And then instead of uh, the vertical axis representing the actual parameter value, we've converted all the values to ranks, relative order, rank orders um, uh, across the chains. And why would we do this? Well, because it, it makes a quick heuristic way. Well, I should say it's good for the calculations of the later criteria like R hat and NF that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, but it makes a great visual heuristic way to quickly assess whether any chain is consistently above or below the others. I'll say that again. It, it creates a quick heuristic visual way to assess if any one of the chains is consistently above or below the others. What you want to see is what I'm showing here, which is that the colors zigzag in and out of one another in this mosaic fashion. So the which which chain is on top is constantly switching. And that means that the chains are exploring the same space. I'll show you what a, a bad one looks like in a, in a few slides, so hang on. Um, and you can see for the other parameters, the same sort of pattern. This is a nice healthy chain. You get this mosaic switching of all the different chain colors. As that because no chain is consistently um, uh, occupying a higher space in parameter values than the others. Uh, they quickly uh, switch and dodge and weave uh, among one another. OK, it's time to talk about these, these two uh, numerical um, diagnostics that are displayed in the Precy output, uh, NF and R hat. Let's start with R hat. Um, R hat is quite common, and maybe you've already heard of it. Uh, when chains converge, we want we want them to converge in two ways. Um, uh, first, we want to check that the start and end of each chain is exploring the same region. That means they're stationary. The chains are stationary. The second thing is we want to be sure that independent chains explore the same region. So we want the chain to sort of converge with itself. That is, its start and its, its end to be in the same place. Um, and we want different chains uh, to converge to the same location as well, independent chains. So R hat is, is a statistical uh, criterion for assessing this, but it's not a test and it provides no guarantees. Nevertheless, it's really useful. What is it? It's a ratio of variances. So as the total variance uh, among all the chains for some particular parameter 
um, uh, uh, shrinks to be the same as the average variance within chains, then r hat approaches one. That's just the way r hat is because it's a it's it's a, a ratio of these two things: the total variance over the variance within chains. So what that one way to think about this is, I, I try to help you with this plot on the right. I've shown you for the the chains that came out of this divorce model, um, samples on the horizontal, sequential samples on the horizontal, and then uh, variance on the vertical, and I've computed in red the between chain variance. And what does that mean? It means the variance uh, among the means of the chains, the mean parameter values of the different chains. And then the blue trend um, is the, the average variance within chains. So we compute the variance of each chain and then we average those variances. That's the blue trend. So what you see is that both of these decline as the chain converges, right? So initially they're very high because the chains are in different places and they haven't settled down yet. Um, and then the variances decline as they stabilize and become stationary. Uh, but the red uh, uh, collapses much faster because these are good chains and that's what you wanna see is that um, the variance is, almost all the variance in, among the chains is, is within them, not between them because they've converged to the same place. And so this is what R hat does, is it tends to approach one. It'll approach it from above though. Uh, and so large values above one are bad. And if you run the chain long enough, uh, you wanna see it uh, shrink down to one or just, just above one, like 1.01 1 .01 or 1 1.02. But there's no threshold. This is not a test. It's not a significance test or anything like that. It's a diagnostic criterion to help you as a warning signal. Um, R hat can equal one and chains can still be bad. Uh, but every little bit of information helps us. NF is the last one of these criteria. This is the uh, often called the effective number of samples. So what does this mean? Uh, one way to think about this is that NF is the answer to the question, how long would a chain be if each sample from that chain was independent of the one just before it? This is a weird question. What kind of maniac would ask a question like this? It's actually a really important question because Markov chains uh, are sequential. Well, they're, they're Markov chains. They're sequential. The, the next uh, parameter sample depends only on the most recent one. And, and what can happen as a consequence, if the chain is not exploring the posterior distribution efficiently, is that the sequential samples will be correlated with one another. And, and we usually call this autocorrelation, that is self-correlation. So what I've shown you um, uh, in the graph in the lower right of this slide is something called the autocorrelation function for the, the chain, uh, the Markov chain for the intercept in the divorce model. And the way to read these autocorrelation function graphs is that on the far left at, at zero lag, the horizontal axis is lag, uh, you've got any location in the chain. This is like zero means self. And then the vertical axis is correlation. And so you'll see that the, the red bar there goes all the way up to one. That means each sample is 100% correlated with itself. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, uh, but the next sample, the one at lag one, right next to it to the right, is has a correlation about 0.5. Uh, and, and that means that each sequential sample is 50% correlated. Yeah, and then the, that correlation declines as we move away so that by the time we're five samples away, there's essentially no correlation between um, between the parameter values that are sampled. And that's good. Uh, this could be better. Uh, often, uh, Stan will do even better than this, and the autocorrelation will, will drop to almost zero after one sample. Um, but Markov chains often show some uh, autocorrelation of this kind. But you don't want it to go too far out. Uh, why? It's not doom. It doesn't mean the chain's bad. Uh, after all, uh, the Metropolis algorithm generates off really highly autocorrelated samples, but it still works. Uh, it, it doesn't mean anything's not working. It just means it's less efficient. And that means you have to sample longer. So NF is the answer to if we could imagine a chain, and we can, where there was no autocorrelation at all. So the autocorrelation function had a spike at zero and then it was zero everywhere else. Um, had a spike to one at the zero lag and then lag one was zero correlation and so on. Uh, NF tells you how long that chain would be um, so this is why it's called the effective number of samples. And the effective number of samples um, uh, is, is nearly always, not always, but nearly always smaller than the actual number of samples you took because your chain has autocorrelation in it. And that means sequential samples share information. 
So uh, they overlap in the information they provide. If they were totally uncorrelated, they provide more information. And so you'll see in the Precy output in the upper right, the NF. Uh, so for this particular model, we drew 2,000 samples. There are four chains, and we're getting 500 samples from each. So that's 2,000 samples that we get to work with. Um, and, but all the NF values are less than 2,000. Um, still, uh, you don't need a lot of effective samples to get a good estimate of a posterior mean uh, or, uh, or even higher moments, uh, uh, some of the outer quartiles. So the, these are uh, good NFs. How big should NF be? Well, that depends upon your problem. I can't give you a general answer to that, but I say some more about it in the book. Okay. Last one to talk about in our hygienic workflow is this thing called divergent transitions. And I'm just going to say a little bit about them today, and we'll talk a lot more about them in a future lecture. The animation I'm showing you here is our skate park example, again, uh, with a complicated shape. But I've changed the, the trajectories so that they're very jagged so that I can show you what it looks like when Hamiltonian Monte Carlo rejects a proposal. So the, in this simulation, you'll see this red point appears right there. And then when the simulation continues after it, it doesn't continue from the red point, but from where it started the previous time. So watch it, see, it starts over from where it was before. That red point is the end of a divergent transition. It's a rejected proposal. What is a divergent transition? Uh, well, so you learned that Metropolis, uh, the Metropolis algorithm rejects a lot of proposals, sometimes most of them, unfortunately, and that makes it inefficient. One of the reasons Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is so efficient is that it, it can accept, let's say, it makes really good proposals because it follows the contours, the gradient of the posterior probability to find good proposals. But it still occasionally makes a proposal that it won't accept. And these happen when the simulation malfunctions, in a sense. It diverges from the true path. So what does that mean? So there's a smooth skate park distribution that we're actually trying to sample from, but we can't see it. And the simulation we're running is actually discrete. That's what those little bar segments are in the path. And I've made them really big here to exaggerate the point. Typically, we'd make them smaller. Why? Because when the line segments are smaller, we get a smoother approximation of the posterior distribution of its curvature. We can roll more smoothly um, on the half pipe. Um, but if the half pipe is very steep in some particular location, uh, which means, of course, the posterior distribution has a place where it changes very rapidly in posterior probability, then the simulation might have time turning that fast. And it could crash or break through the wall, in a sense, uh, inside the computer. And nothing bad is going to happen there except that the algorithm will detect that. It has a way to detect this. Um, and uh, because this is a physical system, a simulation of a physical system rather, and in, in physical systems, the total energy is constant. There's no friction in the system, nothing's lost to, to heat. And so if the energy at the start of the path is different from the energy at the end, it's a divergent transition. Um, and then those, reject, those, those proposals are rejected and they're called divergent transitions in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithms. So having rejected proposals is not a bad thing. Like I said, Metropolis will often reject most proposals. Um, but if you've got a lot of divergent transitions, uh, it could be that the algorithm is, is exploring the posterior distribution very poorly and it's inefficient. And it could result in bias if uh, it's always the same region of the posterior where, where the divergent transitions are happening, then you're not taking samples from that region. And that may not be very good at all. So that's all I'm going to say about divergent transitions for now, but in a later lecture when we start talking about multi-level models, I'm going to come back to this and I'm going to show you ways um, to program around uh, divergent transitions because they're a fact of life. Um, but we live with them and they're not, they're not poison. They don't destroy your project, but we, we should try to get rid of them if we can so that the machine is more efficient and we avoid possible bias. Okay. Uh, before I end this lecture, I want to show you some examples of badly behaving chains, not just good ones, right? It's, it's, if you know what to recognize, that'll make you a lot more comfortable, I hope. So here's an example from Chapter 9 of the book, um, Model 9.2. It's a very simple example. Two Gaussian observations, minus 1 and 1. 
and we're just going to estimate the mean and standard deviation of the distribution these points come from. Now, if your reflex is to complain, wait, it's only two data points, you can't do that. Remember, this is Bayes. We can do that. Uh, the minimum sample size for Bayes is zero. right? We can simulate from the prior, even if we have no data. And we can update the posterior distribution with one data point. Here we have two. This is like luxury. Um, but I've, what's unusual in this model that I've never done before is I've used extremely flat priors. So the alpha, the um, mean here, uh, the intercept, has a Gaussian prior with mean zero and a standard deviation of a thousand. So that's uh, that's a huge variance, and this is an extremely flat uh, normal distribution normal distribution relative to the scale of the data. And then uh, similarly for the standard deviation, I've given it an exponential distribution uh, with a rate to 0 0.0001, which means it declines very very slowly. Uh, so it's very very flat out to very high values. We run this model using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and Ulam, and the Precy output is monstrous. Uh, it's, now you know what the mean should be. It should be about zero, right? What's the average of minus one and one? You can you can fit this posterior distribution with your eyeballs almost. Um, if you look at this, the the mean of alpha is is about minus thirty, and the standard deviation is is two hundred and eighty. This model has no idea where alpha is, and it likewise has no idea where sigma is. It has a mean of 390 and a standard deviation of about 1,000. Um, and if you look at the nf and r hat values, you'll see that uh, these are quite low. Well, actually, the r hats aren't so bad. So this is to give you an idea. Just because r hat is near 1 doesn't mean the chain worked. But the nfs are way below the actual samples that we took. If you look at the, oh, before I move to the next slide, uh, you'll also get a warning when you run this model about divergent transitions. And this is to say that um, uh, the algorithm was having a hard time exploring this posterior distribution, and that resulted in 108 divergent transitions. And it tells you this um, so that you might want to try to do something about them. You'll see that there's some possible remedies suggested by this warning message. And the third one is using informative or weakly informative prior distributions. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, the problem here is that these priors basically say the whole real number line is, is open game uh, for these parameters, and that's not true. Uh, what did the trace plots look like? Um, uh, I show them at the top of this slide, and you'll see that these are not nice, healthy chains. No, no hairy caterpillar uh, illusion here. Um, chains like this, uh, maybe in the really long run, will give you a, a, a reasonable reputation, a representation of the posterior distribution. Um, but you shouldn't trust them, and no one else should trust them either. Uh, and then on the bottom, uh, the same traces, but shown as, as normalized rank plots or trank plots. Uh, and you'll see that um, at any particular point, uh, the, the, the chains zigzag in and out of one another, but only very slowly. So for uh, long stretches, one particular color, uh, be it orange or green, lies above all the others. And that's not what you want to see. Okay, so in these sorts of cases, I like to invoke um, something from Andrew Gelman, uh, who's one of the, the gurus of uh, Bayesian data analysis, or here I call him the Spider-Man of Bayesian data analysis, um, this thing called the Folk Theorem of Statistical Computing. So when you have computational problems, uh, Gelman often says, often it's because there's a problem with your model and, and by that, he doesn't mean the code. He means the whole concept of the model itself. That is the probability assumptions that go into the model. And in the example here, that means the priors. It's not the algorithm or the computer that's the problem here. It's the assumptions that go, the statistical assumptions that have defined the posterior distribution itself that are the problem. You're trying to make an algorithm do something which is not a good idea, and it refuses to do it. Uh, why do I call Andrew Gelman the Spider-Man of Bayesian statistics here? Well, you'll see the Spider-Man above him. Um, uh, I think the saying goes that with great power comes great responsibility. And that's the thing about these algorithms. You, you, we use them because they do really powerful things for us, but we have this responsibility to use them for appropriate ends, for appropriate goals. And that means educating ourselves on what good scientific assumptions are to put into them. You, can, you can't fit any arbitrary uh, scientifically ill-formed model with these algorithms. Um, so that's the folk theorem of statistical computing. And it applies in this case quite well. Uh, so on the left of this slide, I've showed you the same model that, that gives you bad chains. And on the right, I've changed it just so the priors are narrower, but they're not all that narrow. So now alpha has a normal 
um, prior with a mean of one and a and a standard deviation of 10. Uh, why did I make it a mean of one? I'm being a bit cheeky here. It's going to end up near zero. I just wanted to show you that uh, the prior being wrong does not destroy the inference. Um, and a standard deviation of 10 is still a big standard deviation. That's a variance of 100. This is still a very flat uh, uh, prior distribution. But it's not a standard deviation of 1,000. It's, it's qualitatively different. And sigma um, uh, to have a, a rate of 1. So that means that the, the expected average standard deviation is about 1. And for, standard, uh, for standardized data, of course, you, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, but still, this is not a very informative prior either. Uh, and when we fit this again, now we get quite sensible results and we learn the mean and standard deviation of the data uh, as they were provided. The R hats are uh, very close to 1, 1.01 uh, and 1 exactly, and the uh, NFs are uh, much higher. The trace plots look much better. The hairy caterpillar plots that we see here. Uh, you'll see that for sigma, it has an upward uh, uh, a trend upward, right? The, the upward tail there is longer. That's very normal for scale parameters. That's that's not a pathology. That's what the posterior distribution actually looks like. And then the trank plots on the bottom row um, look as they should. You see that zigzagging mosaic kind of pattern as the chains uh, uh, swap off who's on top. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground in this lecture. I want to kind of loop back to the big historical picture of these methods. Um, uh, desktop Markov chain Monte Carlo really has been a, a revolution in scientific computing, and it's not very old. It's only since the 1980s, uh, uh, the end of the Cold War, really, uh, when this desktop Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, revolution began. And it was begun by statisticians like uh, Sir David Spiegelhalter, pictured there on the right, and his colleagues who had this wild idea to start a project called WinBugs, where um, the user, the scientist, or the consulting statistician could uh, specify arbitrary statistical models in the forms of probabilistic assumptions, uh, and uh, like we've been doing in this course. And then the software itself would, would figure out the problem of designing a Markov chain sampler for it so that you didn't have to muck around with that part of it. And this uh, radically accelerates um, uh, scientific discovery, and it catalyzed a bunch of, of later computer software development, and also stimulated a bunch of really deep mathematical research into Markov chain algorithms. Uh, this has been a fantastic thing. And in all of this, uh, scientific computing has been in the forefront, uh, something that's not often given as much credit as it deserves, uh, because it's really enabled scientists to take charge of their research projects. They're no longer hostage to the sorts of algorithms that any particular statistician wants to program for them, they can come to their problems with their models and they can program them directly in software uh, like Bugs. Uh, I don't think very many people use Bugs anymore um, or Stan or Turing or some other kind of modern probabilistic programming language. Uh, and we can work in high dimensional problems uh, and many important scientific problems are high dimension. Um, we can do very important things like propagate measurement error. We'll talk about that uh, near the end of this course. Um, but all along, of course, uh, for this to work for us as, as um, applied data analysts, as scientists, as researchers, uh, we have to remember not to pipette by mouth. Uh, we have to check the diagnostics, uh, both for our own uh, peace of mind and also so our colleagues will trust our results. Okay, that has been uh, week four of Statistical Rethinking 2022. Uh, next week, we're going to get back to models and we're gonna start talking about um, a bigger family of regressions called generalized linear models, which will open up a lot of exciting avenues for getting your scientific ideas uh, meshed with your statistical um, analyses. And I'll see you there.